welcome to a brand new episode of The Partial Historians. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Rad. And I am Dr. G. Welcome. We are tracing the journey of Rome from the founding of the city. So please hop on in, strap yourself down. We're in a pretty turbulent time, aren't we, Dr. G? This is a the most turbulent time that we've seen so far, which I think is saying something. For I was ancient going Rome. to say <laughs> we have dealt with the overthrow of the monarchy. <laughs> I know, and yet it feels like we're on the cusp of maybe something quite similar here as well. We've seen the Decemvirs sort of sweep in with this idea of putting together uh, the law code to make it all nice and pretty, and so they can stick it up somewhere in public. They've had some agreement about those laws. People seem on board, but then the Decemvirs have not relinquished power. This is a huge problem. Yeah, definitely. So the Decemvirs, for those of you who might not have caught up on our episodes for a while, it's a group of 10 men, but there's one man whose actions have recently been coming to our attention repeatedly, and that is one Appius Claudius. He seems to be the bad apple that is rotting the whole barrel. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. G? The bad Appius, as you might say. <laughs> exactly. So Appius has been involved, uh, admittedly, in this first action. I think there were other Decemvirs in on the action. He's been involved in the murder of the Roman Achilles, a plebeian soldier admired by all. But most recently... He's been casting his lusty gaze on a young girl named Virginia. Yes, and this is particularly egregious because it flies in the face of just about everything that he stands for. We know that he's married already. Not that for the Romans that's a particular issue, uh, but she is a young woman, which again for the Romans might not be so much of an issue. But the thing that is a real problem for Appius Claudius in all of this and in conceiving this desire in the first place is that she comes from a plebeian family. And she's a citizen. I mean, this is the thing. Like Roman men, as you say, they're not really bound by any expectations of being faithful to their wives. Really, there's a huge amount of people around them that are fair game when it comes to their sexual appetites, including both male and female slaves. And potentially, I suppose, people that are, you know, maybe passing through Rome aren't, you know, residents of of the area and that sort of thing. There's a lot of people that are, you know, that are open to that sort of attention, as much as I might disagree with that from a modern perspective. But one thing you're not supposed to do is sleep with free citizen people. Yes, this is crossing a number of moral boundaries, as the Romans would understand them. And the culmination of all of this um, came together in our last episode with... Spoiler alert, if you have not listened to our last episode, please go and listen to our last episode before you continue any further. Yeah. It ends uh, with Virginia being killed by her own father in public in order to save her from the dishonor of being taken by this Roman man. Yeah, so this is where we left off last time. We left off with... Virginius, uh, yes, I am going to say Virginius and Virginia because I just can't Elma fud myself up. I don't care what the Latins think of me. <laughs> fair uh, enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we ended with obviously a lot of outcry because this is a shocking event. I mean, lots of people were watching what was happening because they were outraged at what Appius was trying to do. But I don't think anybody expected Virginius to actually kill his own daughter in plain sight. And the fact that you and I both talked about in our accounts that he he grabbed a knife from like a nearby butcher stall, it seems to indicate that he maybe wasn't premeditating this either. I mean, it's it's kind of not clear. Yeah, there is room in both of our accounts from Livy and Dionysius that this was an act of the moment um, and one of opportunity. But the intent seems to be coming back to an idea of Roman morality as well. Um, What do you do as a father uh, in order to protect your family? Definitely. And so obviously, you know, huge chaos uh, after the death. 
uh, Achilles, her fiance, and Numitorius, her uncle, they display the body of Virginia to the people, you know, really riling them up, making them feel really angry about the actions of the Decemvirs and particularly Appius. Whilst Virginius, meanwhile, had just had to obviously fight his way out of the city as quickly as possible before something, you know, he got arrested or something or some lictors got a hold of him. So he's, you know, out of there. Ah, see, now that, that all of these details are yet to come in Dionysius of Halicarnassus, so ah. just you wait. <laughs> all right, okay, well, I think we've basically caught people up then, okay? So we've, we've had a murder, it's really shocked the people. Once again, we've had an innocent, chaste, lovely woman struck down in the name of politics and political change in Rome. I know. No. I know. All right, so there's our recap for now. Let's see where we get up to in the next episode. All right, Dr. G, so I've already highlighted that after killing his daughter, Virginius keeps a hold of his weapon and fights him his way through the crowds so that he can reach the city gate and escape, whilst the fiancé and uncle of Virginia hang back and very much like Lucretia's body was displayed to the people to try and get the riled up against the monarchy. Now we're having Virginia's body displayed in order to rile them up against the second December. Yeah, now I, I think you touch upon a really interesting point here is that the use of women's bodies as political tools whilst not really granting those women agency in and of themselves. Definitely and not. what we see with Virginia here is exactly that kind of moment. Um, once she has been murdered by her father, uh, she transitions rapidly from a human woman um, with her own desires and her own perspectives in reality to a symbol for everything that is wrong with the current political system of the Decemvirs, and particularly of the corruption at the heart of Appius Claudius. And you're totally correct. We've got this nice lineup um, with Livia and Dionysius of Halicarnassus in the sense that we have uh, uh, Virginius uh, going through the town um, calling the citizens to freedom as he does. So he's running through with a bloody knife being like, ah, this December it has to fall. Um, I've just had to murder my own daughter. Um, the wise amongst you might be like, you didn't have to murder your own daughter, but you did, <laughs> which might tell us more about toxic masculinity in ancient Rome than we needed to know. Thank you. He runs through the town and heads off towards a nearby uh, camp on the outskirts. I don't think he's going all the way back to our guide him at this stage. That's quite a, a reasonable way away. Um, but he definitely heads out of Rome. And he does have with him Achilles and Numitorius, apparently, um, at that stage. So they kind of exit the city together and they build up a crowd of plebeians as they go. And there seems to be about 400, 500 of them by the time that they've actually exited the city. Yeah, I kind of get the impression in my account that Virginius obviously has to make a hasty exit because he's the one that's actually just committed murder, which totally obviously would be something that Appius should normally react to in some way. Even, this is the thing about Rome, even though the paterfamilias obviously has a huge amount of power over his children, this is not the usual way that something like this would be carried out. It's not meant to be the kind of thing where you're just like, you know what, I don't like the way you're behaving. You're dead, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do talk about it in that kind of sense where the paterfamilias has that power of life and death. But yes, uh, it would be something that you should not use lightly. No, normally it's something that, you know, you should discuss with other members of the family group beforehand. It's not really meant to be a spur of the moment murder, you know, as you do. And it also helps if you've caught them doing something terrible. Yeah, and, and, and in this case as well, this is the thing, Virginia is blameless. I mean, yeah, he's only murdering her to preserve her chastity. And now that she is gone, 
the buffer between the men who are about to come into conflict has been removed. You know, this is this is what the women kind of serve as in these sorts of tales. They're like a buffer zone where the men are interacting vicariously through them, but then once they're dead... The curtains have parted and the battle may commence. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of get the sense that Achilles was maybe hanging around a little bit after just to really rile up the crowd. And in my account, they certainly are starting to get excited they're obviously in a state of shock because of what they've just seen but it's starting to dawn on them with people like Achilles, you know talking to them and displaying the body of Virginia that this might just be their chance to get rid of the decimers who don't seem keen to be going anywhere anytime soon <laughs> All of that is kind of like sort of latent in the wings in Dionysus's account at this point, because he immediately uh, now switches focus to how Appius is receiving this news. Now learning that uh, the young woman that he's conceived this intense desire for has been slain uh, in public and he doesn't appear to have been at the site uh, precisely where this happens. He doesn't appear to have been an eyewitness as far as Dionysus's account is concerned, which is weird. Yeah, that's interesting because even though I suppose it's not super explicit in Livy, as in he does not say <laughs> Appius witnessed the murder and was horrified, but I certainly get the sense that he's on the scene, at least in the aftermath, because Appius tries to have Achilles arrested yeah, he, he, he summons him and Achilles is like, no, 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 I'm not coming to you. And then he's like, fine, I'll arrest you. But the crowd around him start protecting him. They don't, they don't want him to be arrested either. So Appius is then like, you know what? Fine, I'll call in the young hot patricians. Ayo! <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, so they, they start, you know, coming in and into the scene as well. But then not only is Achilles protected by the crowd in my account from anyone laying hands on him, but Valerius and, Her and Heratius, they come in and they start fighting off the people that are trying to arrest Achilles, it seems. They're actually resisting the lictor and saying, you know what, Appius is a private citizen. We're prepared to fight whatever you're trying to do here. And the Fasces are actually broken by the mob when, the, when one of the lictors tries to attack Valerius and and, uh, and Heratius, so oh wow, yeah. And for, the, for these are this is kind of a throwback to names we haven't mentioned super recently. So these guys are definitely Valerius and Heratius. They're definitely part of the elite. I was going to say, but they and they've also set themselves up in opposition to the Decemvirate as well. Yes, exactly. And that's just it. They're, they're definitely part of the elite. So you wouldn't necessarily expect them to side with Achilles and Virginius and that kind of thing. But they have been positioning themselves as being opposed to Appius Claudius and the actions of the second December. So I guess they've decided they're all in. <laughs> wow. All right. So yeah, I mean, I get the sense from Dionysus's account that Appius is uh, in the vicinity, but is maybe not a direct eyewitness because it says in the text that he learnt of the girl's fate. Right. And I was right. like, dude, how did how did you learn that? I'm sure that you were there. <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe maybe he was just sort of like around a corner on another street or something, um, trying to get some other action because they were all there together. Yeah. And he leaps up with this idea of pursuing Wagenius, which is. Fair enough. I mean, we've got a murderer on our hands, but apparently acquits himself quite badly in public and says a lot of things that are off color. Um, mm. And he also starts to conceive of this idea that Achilles and Numitorius also need to be dealt with as being very close to the situation. So this idea of these three plebeians need to be dealt with is also compounded by the fact that he also decides that he wants Wiginia's body removed from the forum because her body is still there. Um, it's so it's so awful <laughs> the way that women appear in this early part of Roman history. Sometimes it's interesting because both Livy and Dionysius they they could have probably really minimised their role you know they obviously are choosing to tell the story a certain way but the way that they actually play it up and then the minute 
that they're no longer serving as some kind of, you know, it's almost like a tug of war or something between the men. The the instance they're not disputed property or something, or they don't represent something that matters to the men. They're just, you know, discard it. They just drop out of the narrative. I mean, it's a huge problem because, I mean, this is a really chaotic moment as well. Yeah. Obviously, Wiginius has potentially in a non-premeditated way, as you know, with the knife picked up from the butcher's stand, um, has murdered his daughter in public. He immediately flees, which seems like a reasonable thing to do to yeah. a certain extent. Definitely. Um with companions. So they all are like, we got to get out of here. This thing has really turned yes. uh, rather rapidly. And Appius is like, okay, well, we've got to do something with the body, which in, from a certain perspective is a responsible uh, political leadership move. Yes. Um, what becomes quite interesting um, in this narrative is Dionysius tells us that it's actually the people who oppose the removal of, of her body from where she lies. Interesting. Yeah, so the lictors come in and like, we've got to grab that body and they're like, oh, oh no, you don't. Do not touch that body. That is not for you. Yes, it, that, none of this is in Livy. This is crazy. Yeah, so, and this is, to me, this is fascinating because it's the people seem to understand on some level that the visual aspect of this is very important. Um, and they too are seeing her in a symbolic way, yes, I would say. Definitely. So Appius actually has to come down himself and look at the body. Mm. Yeah. He proceeds to the forum, um, accompanied by his crew. So I'm, I'm guessing this includes his young patrician uh, and co. They've got their Ferraris parked out by the crowd. We're coming in hot. Whoop, whoop, out of the way. we got to see this dead body. They're Everyone's looking like, at you. Yeah, they're looking at the crowd over the tops of their sunglasses. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> and according to Dionysius' account, this is where Valerius and Horatius re enter the narrative because they rock up with their posse. Ah, okay. See, yeah, as I said, none of the body stuff is really mentioned apart from the fact that, you know, it's displayed and it's used to rile up the crowd. What happens in my account is that after Valerius and Horatius resist Appius and start saying to people, hey, why are you listening to this douchebag? He's just a private citizen like everybody else. <laughs> uh, Appius tries to get up and talk to everybody, presumably to be like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to presumably to be like, I am not that much of a douchebag. <laughs> but nobody's interested in listening to him. And so Valerius and Horatius, um, they also get up and, and people want to listen to them, but they don't want to hear what Appius has to say. And Valerius demands that the lictors leave Appius, no longer attend him because he is only a private citizen. And Appius, quite understandably, senses the mood and decides that he's going to take refuge in a nearby house when no one's looking. <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, oh, guys, yeah. I'm just going to sneak over here. Yeah, uh, because he can sense, I think, that He's very much in danger of potentially being, I think, seized upon and maybe even lynched. I was going to say, the mood of the crowd has turned. We know what can happen when you just pick up a knife from a butcher stand now. Everybody's yeah. fair game. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so Spurius Oppius, one of the other Decemvirs, actually bursts into the forum from another area and he sees what's happening. He sees that Appius no longer is in command of the situation, that it's getting very dangerous, okay? Um, and so he comes to Appius's aid, essentially, and they talk about, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> this, <laughs> is, this is a pretty dicey situation. Um, but they decide in the end that the best thing that they can probably do is to summon the Senate. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. This is a, a level of detail that I, I'm not sure Dionysius of Halicarnassus gives us, yeah. but I'll give you what he does give us. Yeah. Um, so we have this, uh, these two posses, Appius and his young patrician hot crew, Valerius and Horatius with the resistance to the second disumbrate, but make it patrician. <laughs> and they're, they're sort of mounting a site of resistance around Wiginia's body. And Appius is kind of like, I need to sort of uh, 
remove myself from this kind of situation. Um, this does appear to be a bit of a setback for me because um, the people do seem to be siding with Valerius and Horatius. So what am I going to do? He ducks off um, to the sanctuary of Vulcan to call an assembly of the people oh. uh, because he wants to accuse everybody that's on his hit list of the various things that they have done. Right. So he's like, we need to we need to get all of these people put to death. They're all a problem right now. Valerius and Horatius are now on the hit list. So it's, it's sort of escalating for him. He doesn't go into hiding. Uh, he goes next level. He's like, my enemies have gone high. I'm going to go higher. Um, yeah. And... It's at that point that the body of Virginia is basically in the hands of uh, both the plebeians and the supportive anti-Second Decemvirate patricians. And it's at that point that they move her body and they place it in a different part of the forum. So they, (laughs) yeah. Feng Shui. (laughs) It's all about the vibe. The butcher store is perhaps not the most conspicuous area of the forum. So they move it to somewhere where it's going to get much more eyeballs on it. Uh, Many more eyes on it, I should say. (laughs) Um, Where it's going to be seen by everybody. So that when inevitably an assembly happens and people come to the forum for that, there will be no way to not see the situation for what it is. Which is... A horrifying, horrifying tragedy. That that does make sense because definitely we both got the sense in our accounts that Virginius, in order to pull the murder off without Appius or whoever was watching twigging, he definitely pulled her a bit out of the way, like as much as possible. It's kind of like it all unfolds, I think, quite quickly. Yeah. That's what it would seem like in, in the narrative that I have. And... In stark contrast to one of our episodes. <laughs> we go into a lot of detail Weird. looking at all of the instant things that happen. <laughs> but the effect of having her body on display in the forum in a really prominent way is that it bolsters support for Valerius Petitus and Horatius Barbatus yeah. and their faction. Right. So the plebeians are not in a position where they um, are sort of trying to take a political stance independently of uh, the patrician class. No. But the patrician class are really leading an opposition to the second December at this point. Which makes sense because we've talked before about how in the conflict of the orders it seems so puzzling that the patricians can get away with what they do. And one of the things that's been highlighted by the scholarship is that whoever the patricians are at this point in time, one of the things that allows them to be so dominant is the fact that They stick together, like good waffles do. They stick Mm. together. Um, And really the second December is one of those times where we're actually finally seeing division within the patrician class in a major way. And and that makes sense in my account too, because once these, once Appius and Spurius have decided that they're going to call the Senate, it does apparently start to calm the crowd down a little bit because they know that the Senate are not all fans of the December either. And so they think, oh, this will be good. The Senate, you know, the Senate will potentially do something to seize on this moment. They'll do something about the December. And the Senate just really are looking out for order. They, they're aware that Virginius has fled the city and that he's presumably going to rejoin a part of the Roman army. And so they really just want to make sure that the situation within Rome stays relatively calm. So the expectations of the crowd, (laughs) I think, are going to be disappointed, but they're definitely willing to follow the lead of the Senate, in my account. Hmm. This is really interesting because the the Senate doesn't, has yet to make a mention in Dionysus' account. And I'm not entirely sure when they're going to step in. So yeah, we've got we've got what appears to be or what is described by Dionysius as oligarchic factions now emerging within the patrician class. Mm. So that that division that we're seeing is going to be that sort of linchpin for change, I think, as you've noted. But that where's the Senate in all of this? I mean, the last time they got called, they weren't very happy about it, and they <laughs> they said some things. Um, <laughs> 
But they don't seem to be on the horizon just yet in Dionysius's account. So, I mean, Appius notices the change in the attitude of the crowd as a result of the shift of Virginia's body into a more prominent location. And he decides that it's probably good to leave the forum. And this is thought to have saved his life. Um, Such is the uh, (laughs) nature of what's going on there. And that means that the forum is basically left to the patricians who are anti the second December and the plebeians. And Valerius Mm. and his followers then start making speeches. They're like, well, we've got the forum. Let's let's assemble. Let's have a good time. Now, hang on a second. Hang on a second. (laughs) Is this going to be one of Dionysius's rhetorical moments? Oh, no. One of those is coming. Um, okay. But, okay. but thankfully, not just yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're never far away. <laughs> no, no. That's why I was like, I'm getting the sense that you're building to something here, don't you? Mm-hmm. I am. I you're am. You're clearing the stage. You're clearing the stage. I am. I'm making some room, <laughs> making some room. And I'm making that room for what is going to be the public funeral procession for Wiginia. What? Yeah. <laughs> a funeral already? Yeah. Yeah. They they're going hard. Wow. They're, they're riding this wave. Yeah. They're like, well, we've got a bo- okay. we've got a body now. Uh we've got a lot of uh latent support in the plebeian crowd. What they need is a demonstration to really bring out the feeling. Yeah, but I would have thought like, I don't know, her dad would have wanted to be there, had to be there. I don't know. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> Okay, fair enough, fair enough. He might have snuck back into the city, actually. I mean, it's not its not at all clear. Not in my account. <laughs> He's definitely with the army. <laughs> he certainly he doesn't appear to be here, um, yeah. I have to say. So it does say that the relations of the girl who brought her beer into the forum prepared all the funeral trappings on the most costly scale they could. So there does seem to be some lag time between... When the murder happens and the transition yeah. to having this funeral procession. I was going to say, like, that's very, that's almost disturbingly quick to be prepared to have a funeral. <laughs> mm, premeditated. Let's review the evidence. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, Dionysius narrates it as if it's all just happening one thing after the other. Um, but if the family is is involved in the preparations to some extent, I suppose there's going to be some lag time. But it's not at all clear from the evidence, I have to say. No. Um, but she is paraded through the forum. Uh, there is a range of matrons and maidens who get involved in the mourning process, lamenting her fate, throwing flowers. There's a real building of, of feeling one of the ways that they tap into the sort of frustration and anger with the second December it is to really uh, play strongly the fact that Virginia is a child. Right. They have children's toys there. Oh my God. Oh my God. All of the accoutrements of her childhood are part of that procession as well. And it becomes so uh, sort of extravagant in terms of like bringing out the crowd that the men are also getting involved. And this means that it it kind of like is a a sort of a crescendo moment, it would seem, within the city because the funeral is the most talked about thing um, that is happening. And everybody sort of buys into this uh, idea that the 2nd December it has to go. This is kind of the emotional moment for them. I have to say, I feel like Dionysius is making this up, Dr. G, just because he wants to prolong the tragedy. I'm just saying. I think oh. Livy would have told me if there was a funeral. <laughs> well, I don't know, but uh, Olivia hasn't been great for the details recently. Oh, you, you, rude. Do you not want to have a great funeral procession for our noble I victim? I do. I do, but I just feel like it does make more sense in Livy's account where the climax is just after the murder, you know, in the cha- in the chaos of the moment. And it does make sense that her body is displayed, you know, right then and there to rile people up rather than having this very protracted affair. I mean, I'm glad, don't get me wrong, I'm glad she's getting some recognition and she's having a funeral, but I don't know. 
Yeah, look, I mean, it does, there is a timing issue as far as uh, Dionysus's narrative concerned, but I'm not going to lie, there's a, there's a good, good detail here on a funeral and boy, is everybody sad and upset and then revolutionary in their response. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so back over in Livy's account, the Senate have obviously convened, they've talked about the fact that, look, Virginius has obviously gone to rejoin you know, the troops that he was with before. And that could be really bad for us because if he decides to, you know, march on Rome or something, what are we going to do? Couldn't this also be a problem for Wiginius because the commander of those forces knows that he's scarpered and they'd previously been given orders to prevent him from returning to the city? Absolutely, definitely. And so this is the thing, like Livy just talks about him returning to the camp. Okay, sneaky. Okay. Yeah, but he also has come, in my account, it seems like he's brought quite a substantial number of people with him. So I don't know that anybody's in a position to say no to Virginius <laughs> at this point in time. I came with my friends. <laughs> but certainly he, he's, in a, he's in an encampment which at this point in time is on Mount Vasilius, or Vicilius, depending on how you want to pronounce it, I suppose. The Senate decide to send some of their younger members out to the camp where you know where they currently are and say that the decemvirs that are in charge must use all the resources that they have to try and maintain order and and stop a mutiny from happening so they, they're trying to sort of nip it in the bud stop it at the source they know that virginius is coming with this group of people who have stormed out of the city so they're trying to get to the troops that he's going to go to before he does uh, and before things become even worse, in my account. Wow. All right. I, know. I, know. <laughs> I won't go too much further because I feel like you still have some... God knows there's probably going to be a lengthy account of the wake. And... <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. Just you wait. Yeah. yeah. Um, you'll be pleased to know that Dionysus' account turns uh, to switch focus to what is happening with Wiginius. Um, oh, so nice. so there's nice. a sense of parallel here. Um, and okay. he is returning to the camp um, yeah. at Al Gaidum. We're not sure whether the camp has moved. As you say, it seems to be in a different location in Livy's account. Um, but yeah. we're talking about a place that's sort of to the southeast of Rome. Yeah. Uh, he gets there under the cover of darkness, which is probably for the best because he is apparently all covered in blood. Yep, that's definitely in my account too. And still holding the butcher's knife. Yeah, well, you know what, that make, that actually makes sense to me because I feel like his adrenaline would have been hugely up with everything that's been happening. And so, yeah, if he arrived clean and without the knife that he had seized, I'd actually be a bit more suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he's there, he's, he's ridden uh, with his crew and he's covered in blood and everyone's like, oh, God. And people who are guarding the camp, so that initial sort of perimeter are kind of like, what even happened to you? And so they become intrigued. And so they follow him into the camp because they want to hear what has happened. It's like, this guy's yes. got a story and we need to know what it is. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, a soldier returning back to camp, covered in blood and holding a knife, that something has happened, clearly. And from a soldier's perspective, that could mean anything, particularly strategic information that you might need to know. So there is interest um, to find out what has happened. I feel I feel like some of his fellow soldiers would have been familiar with his story because as we related in a previous episode, <laughs> there was that whole, you know, trying to trying to get to Virginius and stop him from leaving the army before he hears about what's happening to his daughter moment. So it, I think other people would have known that he was returning to Rome to deal with a very delicate family matter. Maybe, but on the surface of it, maybe not as well because when he leaves and asks permission to leave, he asks because he says, somebody in my family has passed away and I need to do the rituals. Can I go? And yeah, and yeah. the general says, yes. And it's only at that high level of um, officer coming into the camp with the message from Appius being like, you need to stop this guy. So I feel like the people at the top, so those connected to the Decemvirate, they definitely know that something's up. But does the common soldiery? Oh, yeah. But I feel like he would have had to tell, like, a couple of buddies, you know, what was really going on. Maybe. But were those yeah. buddies with him? I don't know. Anyway. No, I know. Anyway, I know. Yeah. everyone gathers around the campfire uh, yeah. in the camp to hear this tale. He takes a stand on an elevated spot 
Now, you can almost hear what's coming, can't you? It's a speech, isn't it? <laughs> it look, there's a speech in my account too. It's it's obviously much, much shorter <laughs> than yours. But yeah, he does make a speech in my account too. Okay. He stands on an elevated mound and he opens to make a speech to the camp. And I might pause <laughs> there because I, I, I'd love to hear what Livy's speech is about. Well, look, it's it's fairly much, I think, what you would expect in that he tells the fellow soldiers everything that has happened. And he's pitching the story in such a way that he's like, come on, guys, surely you can see that whilst, yes, I have murdered my daughter, it's really Appius that is the person that's in the wrong here. It's really Appius that is the guilty one. After all, I held my daughter in the highest of esteem. I valued her more than my own life, but only whilst she was chased. She was better off dead rather than allowing like me allowing her to be dishonored. You know, I would have killed myself after killing her because of what has happened. But I felt the need to seize this moment and avenge her with the help of my fellow soldiers. After all, if this happens to me and to my family, surely you can see that this could easily happen to any one of you. And it's really interesting because he kind of positions it as being Appius invading his actual home, like coming into his private space where he's the boss, he's the part of Amelia's, eh? (laughs) And Appius, Appius's lust has meant that his home has been violated because his daughter is now dead. Intense. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. All right. In comparison, uh, (laughs) Wikidius' speech to the camp, as far as Dionysus is concerned, is a little less personal and a little more abstract about the situation. Well, he he doesn't focus so much on what has happened to his family. He sort of translates that into other sorts of ideas. Um, So he talks about the way that he starts off by saying, like, the Decemvirate has been a problem in many respects. And he lists them out. Some of them are pretty disturbing. And it's like the Decemvirs have deprived many of their fortunes. Mm -hmm. They've caused many to be scourged. Which is yeah, essentially well, we, to we know that's true. Uh, yeah. yeah, hit with rods, um, sometimes to death. Um, mm. Forced um, many to flee from the country, even though they're guilty of no crime. They have insulted our matrons and mm-hmm. seized marriageable maidens. So he sort of yeah. refers to it in this sort of broad term. Um, but maybe, maybe Virginia wasn't the first case. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. That's kind of a hint uh, in within this, that this is a broader issue and his is just the most egregious example. Um, yeah. Their abuse of boys of free condition. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, see, this is, the, this is the, the thing about Roman sexuality. It, is, it isn't conceived in the same terms that we conceive of modern sexuality. And the difference between being a free citizen and a slave is massive. Yeah. Whether, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman or whatever it's yeah it's about whether you're free or not yeah and so this reference this idea of the abuse of boys of free condition is suggesting that there is something really disturbing about what the decemvirs are using their power for yeah that's really bad because these of course young boys are the future citizens of rome so exactly. for them, for their body, I mean, this is the whole thing about being a citizen. Being a citizen, the reason why it's meant to be an awesome thing, and I admit I'm probably, you know, projecting a little bit because this is early Rome, but from what we understand about what's good about being a citizen of Rome later on is that it does ensure you a certain protection of your body from various types of punishment and treatment. You know, that, that's very different to a slave's body where pretty much anything is fair go. Uh, a lot of the time, which is very sad, but it's just kind of the way it is. So to be abusing the body of a male citizen is, 
a very big deal. It is a huge deal. And so we get the sense that what has been happening under this second December, it is maybe far worse than we've previously anticipated. And maybe there's a little bit of um, this is being overblown a little bit, but I usually fall back on the idea when thinking about things like this, that there'd be no point making a speech of this kind of nature if people knew something was not true. And we don't know where Dionysius is getting this information from. So we know we're dealing with a historical construction as well. But the implication in a speech like this with that kind of accusation is massive in terms of Rome's self-identity and its politics. However, you do have to wonder a little bit. I, I agree with you that why would you say something like this if it was demonstrably false? I totally get that. And I'm not saying it's not correct. But there is also an element of when you're talking about tyranny, the way that you construct a tyrant and, and people who are indulging in these sorts of political actions, there is a sort of checklist of like what a bad guy looks like. <laughs> and Dionysius... <laughs> Mask, tick. Cape, yeah. <laughs> tick. Damn it, he's a bad guy. Evil laugh. <laughs> <laughs> We've definitely got that. <laughs> I think we're dealing with a bad guy. He's got a moustache <laughs> and he's twirling it. Yeah, it is, a, it is a bit like that, you must admit. And Dionysius is highly rhetorical. It's not that Livy isn't. Livy definitely is. Like there's always rhetoric involved when people are writing these sorts of histories. That's part of the reason why you write them. But I feel like Dionysius, particularly with his Greek background, would be a little bit more leaning into, I've got to make the audience know that this is the point where they go, boo, hiss, for the second December. And so I'm going to give them all the vices. <laughs> and I, I just think that's kind of interesting. Uh, and, and, and as I say, I totally take your point, but the fact that it's not mentioned at all in Livy, who's obviously not downplaying what the second December have been doing. But, but then again, Livy could also be being influenced by his own personal context, because as we've talked before, he's writing under Augustus a lot of the time, during the time when Augustus is forging this new political system. And one of the things that Augustus becomes quite fixated on is regulating the sexuality of Roman citizens, and in particular, regulating the sexuality of female citizens. And that's what we see with his moral legislation. So it could be that Livy is also zooming in on the personal nature of this and, and really drilling down on the traditional values of, you know, the family, the part of familias that's been wronged, you know, the chaste maiden that's you know was at risk all that kind of stuff it could be that he's drilling down on that because of his own context too but i'm just uh, i don't know just a bit dubious that he doesn't mention that at all oh no fair enough and i think yeah. you're quite right when you emphasize the rhetorical aspect of what dionysius is engaged with in this project uh, this is a writer who never misses a moment um, to include a good speech um, and those speeches often tend to read far more like rhetorical exercises than they do as a mirror to the reality. But it is an interesting detail, so I thought I would mention it. Now, oh, for sure. I think I'm going to leave this at this cliffhanger because actually we now, now that I've given you a taste of what this speech has, has sort of got at its, at its front, this is actually a very long speech and I kind of would like to uh, savour those details perhaps in our next episode. Well, that's fine with me because I am, of course, already at the end of the speech because Livy never goes on for more than half a paragraph. <laughs> oh, Livy, so succinct. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you wondering whether Virginius, you know, caked in blood and gore and holding a bloody knife, seems like just a mental person to the other soldiers or whether he manages to win them over with his rhetoric of, hey, it could happen to you. <laughs> Ooh, boy. <laughs> All right, Dr. G, well, that means that it is once again time for us to do uh, the partial pick. <coughs> yes, thank you, Igor. All right, Dr. G, <laughs> what are we dealing with? All right, so in this section of the episode, what we do is we rate Rome against five categories. Each category is ranked out of 10 gold eagles for a total possible score of 50 gold eagles. 
Mm. Mm. All right. What's our first category? That's an excellent question. <laughs> You've forgotten your list again. I have. You? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I believe that military clout. Ooh, military yeah. clout. Look, I don't feel like there's a lot of militariness going on at all in this episode. There is, but I mean, this is the thing, right? So if we kind of string together all the stuff we've been talking about, about the 2nd December, we know that part of the issue they've been dealing with is that the troops aren't doing well because they're not inspired to fight for these guys that they see as, you know, corrupt and evil and horrible and all that kind of stuff. So we know that in the background, Rome is not doing well. It's not a good time militarily. And that makes total sense because along with these sorts of signs of tyranny and immorality and men who are allowing themselves to give into excess, you'd never have in Roman accounts. Oh, but we were also, we were doing really well, at least in our external wars. It's it's a sign of the chaos that's, you know, spreading throughout the entire state. That That's what Virginia kind of represents in this whole affair. So it's not good. I'm going to give them a zero. <laughs> The mention of a camp and soldiery is no. not enough. Yeah. Zero it is. <laughs> we have the category of diplomacy. I don't think that there is really any of that going on. It's a highly contentious time. Yeah, it's difficult to negotiate with murderers. It's difficult to negotiate with tyrants. Um, the whole thing is just a yeah. bit challenging. I don't think we've got dem- diplomacy happening in any grand no, way no. Here. That's another zero. Another zero. zero. Yeah. Expansion. Nope, nope. They're kind of dealing with their own issues. <laughs> hmm. Yes, if only we could read expansion as um, happening... In a metaphysical way. (laughs) They're expanding their minds, perhaps. Are uh, they? Not their territory. (laughs) Well, maybe. (laughs) So it's zero. Yeah. Okay. All right. So far, so nothing. (laughs) We're to us. Okay. Now, I definitely think we can say that we've got something here. Now, as much as you and I might find Virginius's actions problematic, and we might not agree with the value system that we can see on display in Rome. By their own standards, I feel like Virginius, Achilles, Numitorius, even Valerius and Horatius to a certain extent, I feel like they're all displaying some virtus in this episode. Oh yeah, I think I think they're all doing an excellent job. So Virtus is kind of the embodiment of all of the good things that Romans value. And you know, it's fighting from the front. Um, it's showing courage in times of struggle. It's very um, masculine. It's being, yeah. It's very masculine. It's, it is it is about power. Um, it comes from the Latin term weir for man. So that connection is, it, it's something that is intrinsically masculine as far as they're concerned. And each of those plebeians and the two Valerius and Horatius who are going against the second December are all doing it in a highly courageous sort of way. Yeah. I don't know that uh, would Guinness gets to, from our perspective as modern people looking in, we I don't know if I encourage him to be labeled as weird to us, but from a Roman perspective, he definitely would be because he's taking charge of a situation as it relates to his family. Yeah, because we're to us, I think, I, I remember Edwin Judge telling us that we're to us always has to be connected to some kind of action. Mm. And and he is taking action. He's definitely taking action. He sees the problem. He takes action. We would not necessarily today agree with that action, but he takes it. Yeah, definitely. And from a Roman perspective, that has a lot of we're to us about it. Absolutely. So what are we going to give them? How... how... <laughs> How much weird to us do they have? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we haven't got to the main event probably yet. I feel like it's a sub- I mean, I from my perspective, I have to say this is a huge amount of weird to us, I think, because this is for Wiginius to murder his daughter. And I'm not for a minute agreeing with that as an action. Yeah. For Roman weird to us purposes, that's kind of like as intense as it gets in many respects within a familial context. I hear what you're saying. I just mean I feel like we haven't quite got to the the big crescendo because he's only just got to the army. So I don't want to go a full 10. I just... 
Somebody thinks he has more to give. I do. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Maybe an eight then. Okay, an eight. I will I will remember that. Okay. Alright. <laughs> final category. And final category, the citizen score. Okay. So Was it a good time to be a Roman citizen? Not really. <laughs> I mean, clearly you still got the decimvirs in power, which means there's still no right of appeal. And it means there's still no tribunes of the pleb. And part of the reason for this whole affair is just that, that the decimvirs have way too much power. Um, and again, this is exactly what Virginius is talking about when he's talking to the soldiers, you know. They're running riot. They're trespassing. They're not just running things politically in a very tyrannical way. They're now trespassing into our private spheres and, and interfering with our families and our homes um, and going into realms which really are none of their business. So that's not good. But I feel like there is a glimmer of hope at this point in time. <laughs> well, there's nothing like a funeral procession to bring out I some hope. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just kind of feel like there is, you know, there is a, a sense that maybe things are going to change, that maybe the December is at an end. Yeah, look, I think this is a difficult time because I think in the moment um, of living, if you were a Roman citizen living in this period, and let's say you were a plebeian, relatively well-to-do, this this would feel like political chaos. I don't think this would feel like a win. It would feel like a very tense and challenging time with a whole bunch of uncertainty about how things are going to turn out. So I don't know that this is a great time. Um, to be a Roman citizen from that no, perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm not inclined to give much of a score no, for this. No, I think just for the glimmer of hope. <laughs> for the glimmer of hope. <laughs> I see, and, you know, the fact that you can, the fact that they can see that there are at least some patricians and therefore people who can actually make a difference in this world at this time, they can actually see that there is someone in their court corner or at least fighting for the same actually that's that's totally the wrong way of saying it they're not in their corner at all but they are at least uh agreeing that there's a problem and that it needs to be addressed so i think for that small glimmer of hope i'd be tempted to give them one <laughs> <laughs> all right one it is yay all right so that means we have a grand total of nine golden (laughs) eagles which to be honest is a lot more than i thought they'd be getting at this point in time the second december is such a low point guys uh, (laughs) such a hard time to be roman right now i know it's like oh my god can it just be over already i'm like yeah why doesn't it end yeah i mean according to like what we can piece together with livy's account this is all happening obviously in the space of one year presumably maybe a couple of years it's obviously it's obviously a little <laughs> unclear because we don't have the consular <laughs> dating system anymore but yeah it's it's possibly all happening in 449 bce otherwise known as one of the worst years on record but i know there are, i know there are bad times to come but this is pretty bad oh god uh, yeah. this is pretty bad and uh well i guess we'll see whether they manage to dig themselves out from this uh low point um in our next episode i think it's gonna be i think there's gonna be some interesting twists and turns dr g because yeah it's it's not going to be i think the straightforward conflict of the orders that our listeners might be expecting Ooh, oh tantalizing possibilities i know all right so thank you very much for listening to us listeners you might you might have been able to pick up uh i I don't know but dr g and i've had to record this separately which we don't normally do because we are in lockdown so this is a bit of an unusual episode for us but thank you for listening we'll catch you next time Thank you for listening to the latest episode of The Partial Historians. It's Dr. Rad here on behalf of Dr. G and myself, and we would like to send out a special thank you to all those people who support us on Patreon. And since I'm feeling a little alliterative today, I'm going to specially thank Andrew, Angela, Austin, Ale, and Audrey. You too can support our show and help us to produce more engaging content about the 
ancient world by becoming a Patreon. In return, you receive exclusive early access to our special episodes. There are also other ways you can support our show. You can spread the word by buying and wearing some of our merch, or you can support our collaboration with the talented Bridget Clark, who has been helping us to produce some artwork on Gumroad. Whichever way you choose to do it, we are so grateful for your interest and for your support. Look forward to catching you next time.